let's apply the buying center customer map to two very different situations to help you understand how you can be using the same framework for different types of products and services. The first is the family considering whether they want to buy the box of Cheez-Its that the little girl is holding. And at first, this looks like a very simple example, but let's work through it. Let's start with the end user. Uh, obviously, it looks like the little girl would like the, the, the box of cereal or the box of crackers. Um, but then let's think about the other uh, people in the family. Do we think there might be a secondary user here? I'm gonna put the parents in as a question mark. Who's initiating the purchase? Pretty obviously it's the child. Now let's think about uh, who's making the decision. Who's making the decision? The mom looks like she's making the decision in terms of her body language. The, the dad may or may not be in the picture. And then we have the three other categories that maybe feel a little bit less uh, important in this case, but actually have a big impact. First of all, influencer. How does this little girl know about this product? And the article, Major Sales, tends to focus more in on people within an organization in terms of the actual purchase, but influencers can matter, can mean something broader as well. So for kids, it might be around um, uh, YouTube um, influencers, as an example, like these people that open packages on YouTube that little kids seem to love to watch. It might be other social media players. Obviously, TV is going to be part of this picture as well, advertising. Gatekeepers, how is this little girl even able to hold this box and show it to her parents? You have a store buyer in the mix being willing to have this product on the shelves. And then secondly, you have someone that's affecting where the product is, is shown, as well as how much of that product is shown. And so you'll have a planner within the stores as well, determining uh, the positioning of the product. The purchaser in a family situation might be uh, not as important a distinction as you might see in a corporate setting, but in this case, uh, we can assume that one of the parents is actually going to physically pay for the product. Now let's think a little bit about uh, what kind of power each of these people has. What kind of power does a child have? Um, they have they're not in the hierarchy. Um, I guess she could uh, uh, make a tantrum and therefore have some degree of coercive power. Could she have reward power? Maybe if you consider hugs and kisses rewards back to parents. Um, she doesn't necessarily have expert power or referent power. And this is a good example of why so often a product that is very much uh, uh, in demand by users may or may not be successful because users may not really have the power related to the actual purchase. So I'm going to put a question mark for the little girl's power. The parents, of course, have plenty of power here. Um, so it, it may be that there's legitimate power, it may be that there's co coercive power, but they're in a position uh, to to make this happen in effect. For the child, uh, we've already addressed her, her as an initiator. Let's talk about the gatekeepers here. Um, they actually have some coercive power. They can choose not to stock the product and certainly they have some reward power in terms of how they treat the manufacturer. Influencers power is interesting because this is where we're getting into the idea of referent power, where people want to be like whoever it is 
that is uh, sharing the product or service idea. The mom's power, she certainly seems to be, have legitimacy. She may have coercive power. She's certainly giving that look to her kid. She has reward power. Um, she may or may not have expert power and she may or may not have referent power. In terms of the uh, whoever is playing the purchasing role, let's not worry about the power right now because it's not that important in this particular context. Now let's go back and think about their priorities or concerns. I'm going to guess that mom cares about health and she may also care somewhat about happiness in her family. Um, I've had people uh, who act out this, uh, this little scene in my classes. And it's interesting when they talk about the dad's role here, where maybe what matters to him is peace in the family, as an example. For the little girl, what are her priorities? They might be about taste. There might be about some sort of cool factor here related to uh, what she's seen in advertising or on social media. And that relates, of course, on the initiator side as well. For gatekeepers, what are they going to care about if we're thinking about the store as the gatekeeper? It's going to be about profits. It may also be about brand consistency and customer satisfaction as well. So it's not just about profits. In the YouTube world, what they might care about is their reputation. They may get paid for mentioning uh, different types of, of products or services in, in their posts. So what you see here is a lot going on where you're not just having to satisfy the child, you also have to satisfy the gatekeepers so that in some way you're getting into the store. You have to satisfy the influencers because in some way they're the ones that let the child know about your product or service. And you really, really, have to satisfy the decider who may have different criteria and different concerns from the child. So that's a simple example. And obviously it's pretty darn complex. So now what I'd like to do is tell you about this medical device on the other side of your screen. This is Exubera, which uh, was a product that failed in 2006, 2007, despite very, very high hopes on the part of not just the manufacturer, but of Wall Street anticipating this product and therefore driving the, the company's uh, stock price up quite a bit prior to the time that the product was actually introduced to the marketplace. What this is, is inhaled insulin. And so from a user perspective, what we have is the diabetic who is insulin dependent is of, of course a key and the key end user here. For people that are sick and diabetic, their caregiver may be also a key user here. How is somebody going to learn about a new medical product? A lot of times it's from influencers. That might be a provider. Um, it might be like a doctor or nurse practitioner or some other kind of health professional uh, or even a pharmacist. It might also be uh, what in the medical world is so important, a key opinion leader who are people that basically educate uh, providers uh, about uh, new products or services and are themselves very respected in that discipline. Who's the decider? Well, 
if it's going through a medical system, um, it it might be uh, uh, it might be the patient themselves, or it might be the system through which uh, you're actually purchasing your product or service. Um, in this case, the uh, the uh, insulin. Um, gatekeepers matter a lot with medical products. So in this particular case, um, it might be a committee in a system that decides on the formulary or the set of uh, prescription drugs that are allowed to be um, provided by that healthcare system. And this is a way for them to uh, manage both complexity and cost. Um, you can also argue that there's a regulator role as well. Again, somebody outside of the buying center, but who's very important to the buying center. And the initiator might be the patient, the person who asks about the product. It might be the provider. When you think about the kinds of power that these people have, um, the patient doesn't have, might have some legitimacy uh, uh, in that, you know, they're kind of the customer, um, but they don't have coercive power. They don't really have reward power. They don't have expert power. They don't have really referent power, although maybe you could argue about word of mouth. Um, and so the, it's a big question about how much power does the actual patient have? And this is one of the reasons that so often in medical systems, what is easy and convenient for patients doesn't necessarily carry into uh, success of products or services. Let's just say that maybe they have um, some sort of uh, power through word of mouth, which we'll, we'll in this case call um, um, expert power. It's not really expert power, but it's close enough uh, for our purposes. Um, the, oh, I forgot to mention the purchaser. In many uh, medical settings, you'll have an actual purchasing department. You may also have a pharmacy that plays a role here in terms of facilitating the purchase and making things easier or harder for those uh, departments can really uh, affect the, the success of a medical product. Going back to power, um, you might see different types of, um, of, of power on the part of a provider versus a patient. And I'm going to uh, extend the medical system one to the provider as well, sometimes playing a decider role here. Um, so on the power side, the decider may have legitimate power. They might have uh, reward power to the actual people that um, um, actually uh, prescribe, in this case, the inhaled insulin. Um, they might also have some degree of expert power, although that's not typical in, in the decider role. The expert power and the re and referent power are very important when you think about influencers. And it also can matter um, with, with initiators. If they have expert power, they can, um, they can facilitate um, the, a process to actually purchase or start purchasing a new product in a medical system. The gatekeepers here have a very important role. Um, and I'm gonna actually add the health insurance into the gatekeeper role as well. Um, so if you're in a, in a health system that has a committee that decides what the formulary is, they have legitimate power. 
um, and they have expert power oftentimes. The regulator or insurer has some form of coercive power. They can choose not to cover the product or service, in this case, the inhaled insulin. Um, and they may also have some degree of expertise involved here as well. Forgive my messy handwriting. Finally, we think about the concerns. For the patient, it might be about convenience. It might be about no needles, no pain. Um, but there's another thing that this particular product didn't really address, and that's about discretion. You don't necessarily want to call attention to your, um, whatever your condition might be. In terms of the purchaser, it's about, um, again, a convenience, um, streamlining, efficiency, ease of use. Like, is there a code, for instance, often comes up in the, in the medical world. Um, for deciders, the people that actually are running the system may care about cost. They may care about efficiency. While the patient who is paying out of pocket will care, again, about convenience, needles, or pain, and again, discretion. For influencers, they're going to care about reputation. And if you're a key opinion leader who's being paid uh, to do, say, workshops about a product, there's a financial element as well. Um, for gatekeepers, these are the people that are going to care about efficacy, or does this thing work, and efficiency in terms of does this, is this cost effective? And um, for the initiators, it kind of depends on who they are in terms of what their power um, and priorities are, especially their priorities. So very, very messy map. Now let's think about this product. What was interesting here was they were optimizing on the idea of no needles. And the initial conception of the product was not this big and this clumsy looking. But they had to make a number of technical trade-offs as they were going along in order to have a product that actually works. So as a result, they were not able to deliver on discretion. This is a product you have to carry around, and because it works so quickly, you need to inhale the insulin, say, just prior to a meal. Imagine doing this in a restaurant. Um, from a convenience perspective, it's big. It's something you have to carry around. From the point of view of the deciders, and especially the gatekeepers, this thing worked, but so it is efficacious, or, but it's not necessarily any more cost effective than run-of-the-mill generic insulin that you inject. There are no efficiencies from the perspective of either the decider or the gatekeepers. The key opinion leaders were able to um, share a whole bunch about this product but it wasn't enough to, uh, to address the issues of no discretion, low convenience, not being as cost effective as, uh, as um, uh, injected insulin. As a result, this product, which was anticipated to generate over a billion dollars in sales a year, ended up generating only 12 million in its first year and was pulled off the market in nine months. Now, there is injected insulin out there um, and the product has gotten a lot more discreet in much smaller container, 
but it's still just a niche product because it works no better than regular injected insulin. It's an important point for you to think about all the players in a buying center, not just a couple, and also to keep them in mind as a product or service is being developed. 